Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Melanie Schimberger. I teach journalism over in Wilson Hall. That's where you can find me. Um, let me just tell you how I arrived at the idea of presenting this to you. And then I do want to know who, I know many of you in here, but I also want to know maybe a problem you're trying to work through with a mind map potentially. So let me just tell you um, how I arrived at this idea. I'm a journalist by trade. I'm still a practicing journalist, of course, being a researcher at the same time. Um, when I was on the um, court beat and education beat long time ago, one of the things that I often had struggles with, and I'm sure my colleague here, Lee, probably still maybe does from time to time, is how do we go from a bunch of notes to a nice, concise story? Now, sometimes we can work well under deadline, but you know we still need some sort of plan of attack. I had somebody propose to me, why don't you just kind of map out some ideas on a piece of paper? Just start drawing some, maybe some circles and then some concepts in those. I thought, why not? So I did, and I tried it, and it worked decently for a couple of stories. It wasn't something that I always practiced up until my dissertation stage. That was something, if many of you can probably relate, that is a, a beast. So I decided to employ, again, the mind mapping strategy when I ran into some, some concrete walls. And it got me out of a few spaces, some really tight spaces. And then also, there was another time when a professor, when I was working on a uh, master's degree, this is all we did in class every weekend was mind mapping. We would get into groups and mind map. And that was just really a good exercise. And I have to admit, I've only done it a few times since the dissertation. But when we're trying to come up with ideas to present, I thought, why not that one? I think it'd be a good one to share because not only are we all instructors in here, but we're also scholars. So this has some implications both, I think, for your classroom with your students as well as with you when you're trying to figure out how to proceed with your writing. So let's just go around the room and you just tell me who you are, where you're from, and you know what problem are you seeking to solve with a mind map? Alex, we'll start with you. Um, well, my name's Alex Rose. I'm in the marketing department. Um, I don't have a problem per se. Okay, so maybe not yet. Well, yeah, I have many problems. Um, my hope is just to kind of add this to the toolkit. Awesome, very good. Lee, Lee Wright from Journalism, and I thought this sounded interesting as a way like Dr. Schimberger said, you know, being a journalist, you know, sometimes this does help to map out our story. One of my classes, the capstone, we're doing um, a look at the challenges to rural health care, which is a very broad mm -hmm. subject, and I'm thinking this can help them to narrow it down because uh, yeah. you throw in the ACA, you throw in Medicare, Medicaid, all the, poli all the political and economic angles, and they're just, right now, they're sort of like, oh my gosh, it's overwhelmed. and so I want to yes. maybe we could do this as an alternative to our typical coming up with story ideas. Absolutely. Good. I'm in the modern languages department. Okay. Uh, I don't have a problem per se. Good. I just want to learn more about this. Awesome. Well, welcome. Thank you. I'm Kelly Kleinhands. I'm from the Center of Communication Disorders, so we train speech language pathologists. And in my textbook, um, there's every clinical case you can imagine, and one of these maps. And um, obviously, I have like 20 plus years of experience, so I can read them and they make perfect sense. But I, I would like to bridge the gap with my students because I'm sure there's a way to use them beyond just read it and you'll know what to do, but how to teach them the clinical problem solving skills they need Absolutely. with this map in their hands. Very good. Um, I'm Cindy Kramer. I'm from Math and Statistics. Oh, good. <laughs> and um, I teach a lot of the math content to elementary and middle school. Okay. And so a lot of uh, the content we look at is the why's behind things, and so it would be nice for them to like maybe correct, make uh, make some mind mapping um, things on what connects with each other and wh why these ideas make sense. Great. Okay. And that's Elizabeth. <laughs> and she actually, you still have your mind map from the other I day, do, right? I can bring it up. <laughs> yeah, she she did do one, and it actually helped her with the, with the problem. So how about that? Yes. Yes. I'm Austin Trenton, I'm in uh, Political Science and Sociology, and I have uh, an observation this summer of the semester on uh, uh, creative executives, so we're looking at uh, the presidents and dictators and prime ministers, and it's, it's my first time teaching a class, and got a class, and as I'm thinking about studying uh, uh, leadership and how, how does leadership relate to power and authority, all these sort of amorphous concepts that I have to know myself so I can teach them, and I'm thinking, well, how can I mind map these things out to make it easier for all of us to go on this journey kind of together? Because these are things that, how do you define 
power go your way. And so uh, uh, excellent. Yes. Help me to, to uh, you know, uh, uh, to formalize these concepts. Indeed, it can. No, but good. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Mary. I'm from English department. And uh, when I was a student, my teachers used my math a lot of time in order to uh, like increase my language skills and my like you said the thinking skills. So I want I wanted to learn something like how to use this effectively with the ESL students in order to develop their language skills. Very good. Awesome. Okay. Well, it seems like we have, first of all, good representation of various academic disciplines, which is great. And we have a wealth of different issues, challenges, problems we're bringing to the table. So, and um, I will say, even we even had a participant on Monday when I did this the first time. Um, she was able to work through a personal problem involving one of her dogs. So it was really, you know, really something. I thought, wow, okay. So it has a variety of applications in your life. How about that? But one of the big problems we all have, and I think that um, Lee alluded to this, if I can get it to, it's frozen on me, Elizabeth. Oh, no. Oh, no. Well, while she's doing that, I'll just go on and keep talking because um, I pretty much know these next few slides. One of the things that even Lee mentioned was how um, you have this big idea and there we go. You have this big idea, and it seems so overwhelming, okay? And it's like, what do we do with it? And there's a lot of directions you could take with that. And one of the great things is that it helps you to bring a broad idea into a greater focus, okay? Um, so it's not, there's nothing wrong with thinking too big. I don't want to say that. However, when we do start thinking too big and we can't seem to even get near our focus, that's where we think the mind map might help. Um, also, and some of you who have done dissertations or even theses have probably um, encountered, we were always told that if you can't tell in one sentence what your dissertation is about, then it's a little too much. Okay, so you don't have a broad or you don't have a, a, a narrow focus on there and you can't explain it well. Again, that's where a mind map can help. It can help really bring it back down to maybe just one sentence where you can clearly communicate what you're wanting to achieve. Now, I want to share with you just some similarities with a mind map, okay? Because maybe some of you have heard of these or you've used you know, a few of these from time to time. In feature writing, and Lee, you probably remember this, the angle tree. This is probably, to me, the most similar as far as when it comes to journalistic applications. But well, we do start with that broad topic, and we're going to take that topic and put it in the middle of a piece of paper. And we just put it in a center circle. And then we have four directions or angles you could pursue. So you could have just the angling, or you can make it you know, up and down, side to side. And then you research and interview those specific areas that you've highlighted. That's one similarity to a mind map. You all have probably even thought about doodling. Okay, and we've seen some great, um, some good sound research in how doodling does help to stimulate those, those thought patterns a little bit. Post-it notes. Um, several years ago, I think it was maybe 1999, 2000, somewhere in there, I participated in the um, Commonwealth Institute for Parent Leadership, which is through the Pritchard Committee for Academic Excellence. And for about three or four months, every weekend, I had to go to Paducah and meet with other parents and um, learn how to improve achievement in our schools. And one of the things that our facilitator, and I remember her very well, Sheila Cruz, she was a big uh, proponent of post-it notes. She loved post-it notes. So I thought, okay, so she would bring in these large canvas types, you know, pieces of paper that you can put on easels. She would tape them to the walls, and we would have problems. Say there was a problem identified in math. So we would come up with various solutions. And then it just kept going on. Um, and then we had opportunities during breaks to actually visit what was on the wall. If we found something on a post-it note that we felt maybe applied to another area, we could either take it or put another post-it note on there. So immediately we were seeing some relationships among some solutions and problems, okay? So some of you may have used a similar tactic with that. Um, so now that you've seen just some similarities and some things that are out there, let's exactly define mind mapping. It is a concept that is, it's relatively new. 
Um, it's nothing really that ancient. Um, it was developed in the 70s, Tony Buzan. He is a leading authority um, on the brain, learning and memory. However, I think in recent years, he has been more of a great marketer of mind mapping, especially with his online product. I will say, um, and I will offer some suggestions if you're wanting to use online mind mapping, I don't really recommend it. I think it's better to put the pen to the paper and then you go from there. I'm a big believer in that. It's great to have technology, but I think it defeats the purpose of mind mapping when we're going to use some technology. So mind mapping is a non-linear approach to learning. In fact, if you are to, um, in fact, I'm looking at your notebook right now, and already we've got notes going down the page. And if you were to go back to those notes, it's, you have to then go through them, okay? And then it just starts, you know, just creeping up some emotions there. With mind mapping, you're going to find that things are spread out, okay? And then you can start to visually see some things connecting, all right? So it is a form of visual outlining. It's a diagram. And in that diagram, you have words, simple words, okay? We're not writing out big sentences or anything like that, putting paragraphs. We're doing some simple concepts. And they're going to be contained in various shapes. You can also put pictures on there. You're going to have arrows going all over the place, okay? So it's going to end up really looking like a nice diagram, but it's only going to be something you can really refer to yourself. If you were to try to show your mind map to someone else, it may not make that much sense. It's only for you. It's your map. It's your map of your brain, basically, as to how you were thinking about things, okay? So it's going to force you to think and explore on those concepts alone as you are in that visuospatial space, okay? And then you'll start to see some relationships that flow from that central theme in that center, and they branch out to the peripherals, okay, and into nodes is what we call them. It helps you to gener generate, visualize, structure ideas of any kind, okay? Um, and I'll share some of those examples from the other session as far as just descri describing those in a few minutes. We also discovered that mind mapping is great in studying, okay, even for students. Maybe a new way for them to, rather than giving them a test guide, you can have them mind map something in class. And if they can explain it to you, then that's, you know, making some achievements there. It can help you to organize anything, okay? Uh, problem solving especially, decision making, and of course, writing. Okay. Now this is what I go through. Um, even today, after you know a 25-year career in journalism, I still have this feeling of dread. In fact, I felt it Tuesday night as I was writing stories. Okay, and I still feel dread a little bit. Going back to our writing groups, Elizabeth and Lee, you know, um, and then Alex, you know, we've been we're like, okay, great. And that is one of those feelings I encounter when it comes to trying to put together a manuscript. You, know, you just dread. You have to go through all this material. You've got probably notes on one notebook and notes on the screen and just, you know, everywhere. So this can actually, I think, minimize some of that, that feeling of dread and you can try to store something visually in, in one space, okay? It also allows you to, um, with a mind map, you're, you're, what, you, what you might be doing is taking some notes, putting it all in one logical arrangement, so that way you're not overlooking something. That's another thing that I really like about mind mapping, is I can take my notes, filter through them, and then pull out some things that I want to work with, okay? The beauty of a mind map, too, is you can't really accomplish it all in one setting, okay? It might be one of those you start, you work on for a little bit, you might go back to it two days later. You might keep it for a month. You might be able to figure things out in 30 minutes. I don't know, that's gonna be up to you in your situation. But you can always return to the mind map. And when you return to it, I, your thoughts are already um, pretty much centered as to what you were doing, okay? So your thinking is restored a lot better. Nothing is missing, nothing's really lost at that point, okay? So if you're still not really maybe sold on the idea, one thing that I came across, it was just yesterday, and I just pulled out excerpts. And what I can do, um, Elizabeth, I can send you this, and then you can send it out to all the participants. This article came out, actually it's a blog post from PBS's Parents Blog, and it was published just a couple of days ago. 
and what it was discussing was research as to how we need to probably get children going back to learning how to draw and read maps. I thought, wow, okay, this is great because there is a connection here. It's all about, again, that spatial thinking, all right? And I loved this part of this quotation here, seeing in the mind's eye. And I think that's what your mind map will do whenever you go back to it, you put yourself right back in your mind's eye, okay? You're just right then and there. So I just pulled some of those experts out, or excerpts out of the, um, of the blog to show you just, I think, the, the correlation between even at a young age, drawing maps, I mean, physical maps, how to get from point A to point B, even in your own thinking, getting from point A to point B, okay? So we're just gonna talk about a few ways you can use mind mapping. Um, it's been used in a number of environments, flipped classroom, um, any type of, uh, group settings, things like that, okay? With planning, if you are trying to get through, trying to figure out what to do with a lecture, mind map can help. So it can help you with some lesson plans. It can also help with your research agenda a little bit. Again, you're working on that manuscript and you're stuck, go to a map. Get a piece of paper and just start, start getting the ideas out of your head. You've got things in your head, they're just not connecting. That's what it is, okay? We've talked about the organizing, being able just to get your ideas out on paper. Um, and this is not just for you. This is also maybe for a student who might be having some difficulties. Of course, in teaching, um, to generate discussions, getting away from the PowerPoint maybe, getting away from the chalk and talk, okay? Um, and then this actually gets your students to do some collaboration. They can talk, you know, kind of give you a break a little bit in the classroom. Um, kind of goes into the next point about presentations. They act as, you know, um, engagement pieces in a lot of ways, so get students talking. It is creative. Um, this is where I think students tend to maybe, um, maybe overdo it. They might get a little competitive with each other. I know even on the graduate level that happened with us. It got to where one group had a nice mind map and we had to you know, we had to outdo them. So, but I mean, the, the, still the great idea is we were involved in the material, okay? And actually, I can remember some of those things that were being discussed just because of the mind maps we created, which they were beautiful, I, I will say that. With learning, it can help students reinforce their knowledge and their mastery in material. We actually had a participant um, in Monday's session talk about, um, with the study guide, for instance, and one of the questions was, well, if the mind map is only more for you, then how can I assess what they know? The thing is, if a student can communicate somehow to you by walking through their mind map and illustrating that they know that material, I think that's, you know, a, a good assessment piece right there, okay? And some of these other next few points, they kind of overlap. So I talked about the collaboration. They can work together. I just got finish talking about assessment. Although in your case, you could at the beginning of class have them mind map something before. Just take a few minutes, okay? It won't be very illustrious, but it'll be, you know, at least decent. They've got some ideas out on paper. You do maybe your lecture or somehow discuss your material. And then how can they go back to that mind map and perfect it? What more do they remember that they can start making those connections better and understand the material? And then, of course, comprehending that just kind of flows from um, their ability to, to learn the material. And it's also interesting to see how students, when they really get involved, they can move from one point to another, and they're just developing more nodes, and they're just really expanding what they know. So hopefully, by the end, you have something that's similar to this. So right in the center would be basically your central topic. Okay, just something very, it might be broad, okay? And then you may have a subtopic that goes out here, and then another one, and then another one. And then you can kind of, when you get really creative, maybe you're really wanting to do more relationships among the material. Maybe the blues will represent something. Maybe the pinks will say something else. You know, it's all up to you. Again, it's about how you are connecting material together to make it sense to you. All right? These are just some simple steps to creating a mind map. It's really nothing that um, that difficult but you are going to start with just a blank sheet of paper now we will be doing this I will say that it's 
better if you can to use as large of a piece of paper as possible, maybe a poster board, something. Especially if it's going to be something that you know you're going to be building on quite a bit. Now, I have used napkins before, you know. It's just whatever is going to be available to you and anything you need to get out of your head, okay? So that's really key. But this way, if you have a large sheet of paper, you can just really expand those branches and those nodes even more, okay? Colored pens or pencils, again, whatever's at your disposal, but the reason why, it boils down to what I just said a while ago, you're making those connections. Maybe those yellows will represent something to you, okay? Maybe once you identify a subtopic, maybe you want to build on that and make it into some reds. It's up to you, okay? All right. When you draw some of those main branches, they're gonna, you're going to continue on with some key words. And that's really um, fundamental here to understand is it's key words, okay? Um, every now and then I might add in a sentence, especially if ideas start coming together, okay? But you don't want every node, every circle or square, however you do your shapes, you, you don't want to be putting in sentences all the time. Okay, otherwise, then you've gone right back to note-taking all over again. Okay? Pictures, symbols, images are really good. Anything you want to do. I like to use some, some like cloud bubbles, you know, just it's whatever. Okay? And then you might find that as you are working more, that the sub-branches are going to be linked together and it can just create even maybe additional topics that you could explore further on. Um, there are some, like I said, some online computer versions of mind mapping. I mind map is Buzan's toy. Um, I have not used any of these at all. I've refused to use them because I think, again, it just, it just really negates what we're trying to do here. But those are possibilities should you are more tech savvy and want to do it that way. MindMeister, and then Microsoft has a version called Visio, and there also is a mind mode. Okay? So those are some possibilities should you want to do it on the computer. I think it's just not necessary. All right, a couple of assignment ideas. And of course, I'm sure you will come up with more, but these are just a couple to, to maybe you know, generate some, some thought in you. Um, you can require your students for maybe some certain class readings to do mind maps. Of course, you're probably thinking, well, if I can only get them to read, but you know, that's <laughs> the thing. Um, this might make it you know, necessary for them to do. Um, have them create that mind map. And then maybe, you know, maybe a simple participation grade, something like that. That way you can tell, yeah, I think you did do the reading. There's some noted concepts in here, and you're able to explain it to me or to a partner. Okay? So that's a possibility that you could, you could do with that. Another one, and this is probably more um, pertinent to many of you, addressing a research question. So again, you know, we're linking topics how they relate to it. maybe a theory you have identified for research, um, you know, just anything to help you progress, whether it be for you or your student, okay? Those of you who might advise students in research projects, this might be something to employ with them as well, okay? And then basically it's just that research question becomes that central theme of the mind map, all right? Any questions so far before we turn it loose to you? All right, so yes, let's practice. You will find in the center some pieces of paper that are this size. I've already started my mind map, and I'll probably get to it in a second. And there's also some markers, should you all want to use those. You don't have to. If you want to use your pens or paper, you know, uh, pencils, that's fine, but um, we'll just see, okay? Do I need to, I'll do this. They are, yeah, they are. Take one down, pass it around. All right, everybody have it. <laughs> yeah, just throw have the, I was going to say, just throw them all out. <laughs> Cindy? Okay. Kelly? Um, come on, come on. <laughs> <laughs> you want two? We do. <laughs> you need 
Yeah, yeah you could use, yeah, we, we have plenty, Perfect. so yeah. there are plenty. The All right. We'll take a few, maybe about, you know, maybe five to seven or even up to ten minutes. I'm just going to kind of watch and, and see. And then we'll, we'll break so that way you can, we can see how this is working for you. Okay. Can you give us a Hello, I am Dr. Melanie Schimberger, and I teach journalism here at Murray State University. Today, we're going to be looking at mind mapping really briefly. It is a possible methodology for you to use with not only yourself with research, if you're trying to write a paper and you're stuck uh, with thoughts in your head, it's also something you can use in the classroom as a teaching tool so that way students can engage with the content and learn from that knowledge. So mind mapping really is not that difficult, but I think some people realize that they may not know really where to start. Mind mapping is simply a way for us to visualize a problem, a situation, or what direction we need to take with the project. So we're going to use one of my projects for an example. I am working on a manuscript for a paper that will be uh, presented at a symposium uh, next month here at Murray State. It's a little outside of my territory of journalism history, but it's still rather tangent to my field, but it's still something I'm having to work through. It is about the, uh, the Works Progress Administration and the New Deal pro uh, programs and um, looking at bookmobiles. Here in Callaway County, bookmobiles were not really a direct result of WPA funding, the road construction was. So I'm making that connection from road construction to the bookmobile and then the development of the library. Anyway, I've been doing a lot of research and taking a lot of notes. So I've got all this information. I don't know what to do with it. So we're going to go ahead and try to construct a mind map to see what, ex what directions and angles can I take with this. So to make this rather easy, I'm going to assume with a mind map, you want it as large of a space as possible on a piece of paper. I'm going to use this part of my screen here so that way you can see what I'm talking about. So again, this is mind mapping. And I'm just going to write mind map on here. Okay. So with a mind map, you want to start in the center of a piece of paper. Um, and you can just start with the circle. So I'm going to put a circle. And what is the, the broad topic I'm dealing with? I'm talking about uh, bookmobiles during the WPA period. So I'm just going to put bookmobile right now. Um, I'll just put bookmobile and then WPA. Even though, again, it's not a direct result of WPA funding, but I want to show how still that was a connection there. So I've taken a lot of notes, I've done a lot of research, and um, I have been able to transcribe a lot of my notes. But wow, I have a lot of information and I don't know how I want to piece my manuscript together. So let's go ahead and just identify some areas that I've already explored. So we're going to use some branches. And this is what these are, just really simple. And you can actually use different colors. And in those, at the end of those branches, I'm going to put in a shape different than a circle, maybe some clouds of some kind. You don't have to be artistic with these, but sometimes people like to be pretty, pretty adventurous with these, and that's quite all right. So I'm just going to maybe just draw a few clouds to kind of get me started in my thought process. Okay, I might want to switch to another color. You can do that. Sometimes colors can help to um, allow you to see what patterns you're taking. So in each of these clouds, I'm going to put certain concepts or subtopics that are going to be related to my, to my overall um, paper topic. So, so far in my research, I've uncovered that um, it's definitely going to involve some oral history. So I might want to just put oral history right here. It definitely will look at some history um, of the uh, Callaway County uh, bookmobile itself, just some basics. So I'll just put like basic research. And then I might also want to look at library development. Okay. And then, of course, we all know that to some extent that, you know, libraries influence things. So maybe I want to see what the influence, what's the overla um, uh, uh, everlasting influence that's come across um, from this. And then I can just fill in topics along the way. Okay, so I have a mind map. 
Well, now maybe I'm wanting to see visual spatially. This is what the purpose of a mind map really is, just to see things via spatially. You're almost looking in your own mind's eye is what you're doing. So maybe oral history. I've interviewed some people. Um, I've interviewed one lady. I'll just put her initials here. One lady I would love to get in touch with, but it's, it's a little difficult right now. And then maybe I want to do some um, current um, people to talk with uh, as far as for current information. So I'll just put current people. In my mind, I know what, what that means. Okay. Um, and then let's say influence. We can look at... Um, adult education, how all of that has spawned into that. We can also look at, um, in addition to adult education, we can look at literacy, okay? It can go on and on and on. Okay, great. I've got some great subtopics. What am I going to do with all of these? As far as, like, I still don't know my order, and that was where my problem was. What is my order? So I'm now able to look. And, and try to make some connections. And as I make connections, then I realize my order. So maybe I need to talk first, just the basic research. So I might just put a one here. And then maybe I'm going to then spawn into possibly um, with library development, how bookmobiles kind of led into that. But you know what? It's going to integrate maybe some of my oral history. So I might uh, possibly do a 2A. I could do that. And then I could talk about how all of this has influenced with these um, objectives here with adult education and literacy. The beauty of a mind map is I kind of put together this inside of a few minutes, okay? The, the time that it takes you to put a mind map, mind map together is up to you. You might decide to spend 15 minutes before actually trying to start writing a manuscript to see what direction of your paper you might want to do. You might, um, and then after 15 minutes, uh, maybe go back to it. This is a mind map I have been working on, and I do have one put together. So this is kind of working from my memory a little bit. But um, it, it's been a process of about two to three days. So I might go back to it. And that's the beauty of a mind map. When you go back to it, you instantly can see where you are in the process. No more trying to flip through notes and trying to find things. A nonlinear approach, visual, spatial. These are the key words here when, when working with a mind map. With students, you can use this in the classroom. Uh, maybe you can use it as an assessment tool. Have students come in before you start your lecture. Have them mind map the material you're going to discuss today to see what do they know based on maybe something they were supposed to have read. Have them do a mind map. And then, and it doesn't have to be long, just be five minutes, just some things that instantly come to their head. And then um, you can, um, maybe 15 minutes before the end of class, have them mind map some more based on what they started. One thing that you might realize, too, with a mind map is that you might find that there is no solution and you might have to start over. That's okay. So a mind map doesn't immediately have to be the product you're always going to be using. You might learn that this is not the approach I want to take and you maybe realized in the process what you do want to do. So you start a new mind map over. That is quite all right as well. But the whole idea behind this is to be able to get the ideas out of your head that are swimming in your head, put it on paper, find connections, and then you can get to really the root of your problem or your challenge. I hope mind mapping works for you, and I am eager to, to see and, and hear how it works in your classroom or in your scholarly activities. Thank you.